members of the jury, it now becomes my duty as the presiding judge of this trial to instruct you as to the law of the case and in respect to your duties and responsibilities. It is advisable for you to have clearly in mind at the outset just what your relations are to this litigation. You are part of the court. In fact, you are just as much a part of the court as the judge on the bench. You have certain well-defined functions which are distinct and separate from those that help to the court. It is the duty of the judge presiding to maintain order, rule upon the admissibility of evidence, and to instruct you as to the law. On the other hand, you are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts, of the credibility of the witnesses. After you have once determined upon the facts, there is nothing that can interfere with your verdict unless the presiding judge happens to commit an error in the law or the verdict is against the weight of the evidence. So it is your decision that really determines the right of the parties in this litigation. There are sharply disputed questions of fact here, and those you must decide, and it is upon those questions of fact that the rights of the parties depend. The plaintiff in this case has the burden of proof to establish every fact necessary to make out his case by a fair preponderance of the evidence. That means that the evidence must fairly preponderate in his favor. If it preponderates in favor of the defendant or is evenly balanced, the plaintiff cannot recover. By preponderance of evidence, however, is not meant the greater number of witnesses nor the quantity of the evidence that is given. It is the quality of the evidence and the convincing and believable quality of the evidence. In addition to being judges of the facts, you are the judges of the credibility of witnesses. That means it is for you to say what witnesses you will believe and what witnesses you will not believe. In, the connection, in that connection, it is your duty to take into consideration the interest which the witness has in the case, if any, or any bias he may have. Take into consideration his demeanor on the stand and his manner in giving his testimony and make up your minds what witnesses are telling the truth. An interested witness is one who has a pecuniary interest in the outcome of the litigation. The law requires you to scrutinize with care the testimony of such a witness. If you believe that because of such interest he has exaggerated or colored his testimony, you have a right, if you choose, to disregard the entire testimony of such a witness. Of course, bear in mind that an interested witness may be just as truthful as a disinterested witness. If any witness has willfully testified falsely as to any material fact, it is your duty to disregard such testimony, and you have a right, if you choose, to disregard the entire testimony of such a witness. In that connection, bear in mind that a witness may testify falsely as to one fact and testify truthfully as to other facts. There are two defendants here, and the plaintiff in this action seeks to hold them responsible, both responsible, for injuries which he claims to have sustained by reason of the negligence of both. He claims that he himself, at the time that he met with the accident, was entirely free from contributory negligence. At the outset, he has two facts that he must establish to your satisfaction by a preponderance of the evidence. He must satisfy you that he was injured through the negligence of these defendants, and that he himself, at the time, was free from contributory negligence unless he establishes both of these facts to your satisfaction, he would not be entitled to recover against either. It is important, of course, for you to consider this evidence from the aspect of both the defendant 
and I think it will be helpful if you will take up the issue in the following order. If you come 